day, I work for an agency that helps refugees rebuild their lives, essentially. So today, I'm Woo! going to be giving you a top-down systems analysis of the humanitarian system, what it does now, and what needs to change. Right now, we're facing an unprecedented crisis of 22 million refugees and another 44 million internally displaced people. And our humanitarian system is responding to yesterday's refugee crisis, when the narrative was that refugees fled and they went to a refugee camp that served as a temporary spot where they could get food and shelter before returning home. But in reality, uh, last year, refugees less than 1% of refugees returned home last year, and less than 3% of refugees access resettlement. So a new paradigm or a new narrative is needed uh, to, in order to help these millions of people that are stuck in limbo with no way home. Um, now here's a quick, a quick snapshot courtesy of UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, showing general migration patterns. There are crises all over the world, but they have the same thing in common. There are three traditional solutions for a refugee. Repatriation, or going home, Resettlement, which is finding a new home in a different host country through the UN, or local integration, which is largely unexplored. More on that later. Um, so, less than, again, less than 1% of refugees returned home last year. And it's so case by case, depending on the, situ the political situation at home, it's not something the humanitarian system can collectively work, work toward. So, if we're following the traditional narrative of a refugee's flight story, the next stop after fleeing is going to a refugee camp to await your settlement. Um, about to, okay, there we go. Uh, this is Dadaab, located in Kenya. It is the largest refugee camp in the world. It was built in 1992, and it is home to 250,000 refugees. Children live there who have never known another home because their grandparents fled to Dadaab and have waited to be resettled for two generations. The average time that a person remains a refugee is 17 years. So camps offer no, they, they offer food and shelter, they offer no education or work opportunities. So millions of people are spending almost 20 years with their lives on hold, essentially in a human warehouse. Um, the system is called, it is broke and broken, and UNHCR itself has lamented being in the business of administering misery. So that's what happens when yesterday, when yesterday's humanitarian system responds to today's refugee crisis. Um, and that's why so many refugees are fleeing, uh, they're risking their lives. You've seen this, you've seen a photo like this, I imagine. Um, risking their lives across the Mediterranean, or they're fleeing to urban areas. Now, these days, more than half of the world's refugees live in urban areas rather than camps. Um, <clears throat> urbanization is the shift from encampment to urban areas. That is what this phenomenon is called. Um, cities offer different protection concerns for refugees. They offer opportunities and the potential to live anonymously, make money, and build a life, but also imagine what happens when you arrive in a new place with no local language skills, no city-specific survival skills, no documentation, no family, um, no rights to work. Um, so that's where that's the, that's the situation that more than half of the world's refugees are in now. That is where the refugee crisis lives now. And our outdated system is still clinging to this idea of refugee camps. Um, but they are wildly different needs that it's just not set up to provide. But there are case studies showing that local integration is the new frontier of refugee aid. One such case is Uganda. Uh, refugees are legally allowed to work in Uganda, and it was found that in Kampala, the capital where many refugees flee to, 21% of refugees own a business, and of those, about half of them employ somebody who lives who is from Uganda. So it's hard proof that refugees can be a rising tide for countries bringing the poorest nationals with them. So different agencies have studied, have been studying different populations over just the past two years and coming together and realizing that this is this is this is a, an option, this is a lasting solution for refugees. And this is the resulting concept called self-reliance. Um, and it's uh, and this was this is a definition that was agreed upon in 2016. It was very recent. Um, Lots of different uh, refugee populations have been, um, sorry, lost my train of thought. Yeah, thanks for the support, everybody. Um, so the agency, so these are the necessities.
necessities of uh, the, uh, no, now they're gone now. So there are many, <laughs> there are many necessities that a refugee uh, needs. That is the framework that is built, agreed upon by many national or international entities at the highest level of the humanitarian strategic system. The agency I work for has hard data saying that refugees can rebuild their lives in about two years, just given the right age. So two years versus 17 years in a camp. So and that's why I want you to keep that with you when you think about the world's refugees, and I want you to think about them as assets um, rather than beneficiaries, endless beneficiaries of a system that will not uh, solve any problems and continue to offer band-aid solutions. So I hope you learned something today. Thank you. Very much.